thank you for joining us today um, for this panel on how to bring creativity to your research journey, uh, which is something I know we're all interested in. I'm Helen Cara, I'm chairing this event today, uh, and I'm very happy to be here um, and to be doing this with my colleagues who I will introduce to you in a moment, but I just want to run through a couple of housekeeping things. The event's hosted by Bristol University Press, um, publisher extraordinaire of which Policy Press is an imprint under which the series we're talking about is published. Uh, we have a the Q and A function for questions that you may have. Please put your questions in the Q and A at the bottom of the screen, and you're welcome to use the chat for any general points you want to make. And I'm just saying a little hello in the chat for people. Um, if you have any technical problems, please put that in the chat and my colleague Baha from Bristol University Press will do all she can to help you. Um, we have got closed captions enabled on this webinar. There's a button at the bottom of the screen for CC live transcript. Um, sorry, one second, the post is just arriving and it's a new post person. Oh yeah, I, get, I gathered that, thank you. I did hope that would happen while someone else was talking, but never mind, it's one of those things. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got closed captions. There's a button at the bottom of the screen where you can click CC live transcript if you want to show text or hide text. Um, people attending this webinar can order Bristol University Press books at 50% discount, which is amazing, half price. You need to use the code BUP24 at checkout. I will put that code in the chat. That's BUP24. Uh, and that will get you your 50% discount. And we'll be sharing some links during the event. Um, and Bristol University Press are also offering a free ebook copy of my book on creative research methods. So if you just add your name and email address to the newsletter list via the form shared that will be shared in the chat, um, then a copy will be sent to you. And we'll have a this webinar is being recorded and that will be available to you all after the event. Baha will send out some links to that. So I'm just going to share my screen for a short time to talk about the series a little bit before I get hand over to a couple of the individual authors of books in the series. So here we go. You should be able to see my screen now. Yes, somebody give me a thumbs up. Yep, great, marvelous. So this is the series that we're launching with this webinar, Creative Research Methods in Practice. And I'm the editor of this series. And the idea is that this books are short, practical how-to books on different creative methods. So I'm just gonna scroll down to show you the books that we have in the series at the moment. When I say at the moment, they're coming. So Photo Voice Reimagined is by Nicole Brown, who's with us today. And that will be published in April next month. Then Fiction and Research by Becky Tipper and Leah Gilman. Leah is with us today, and that will be published in July. Doing Phenomenography by Amanda taylor Bezik and Eva Hornung. Amanda was going to be with us today, but unfortunately for personal reasons, she can't join us. Um, and that's quite last minute. So I will be doing a little bit of talking about phenomenography. I'm no expert, but I have been involved with the book's development. So I can talk about it to some extent. That will be published in September. And in December, we'll have Encountering the World with iDocs by Ella Harris. And we also have books currently being written um, there's one by a couple of South African scholars on poetic inquiry and decolonization. Um, Dawn Mane, who's Professor of Creative Research Methodologies at Cardiff University, is currently on study leave writing a book on sandboxing, which is a method she's developed. Uh, we'll have a book on creative sonic research methods, which will be really interesting, how to use sound creatively in research. And I've just this morning had a proposal arrive in my inbox on using comics in research. So this is what I, one of the things I love about creative research methods. It's such a broad area of study. Um, it's so practical. It's so helpful to so many people. And this series is really going to bring some practical, helpful, short, affordable books, or at least affordable by Euro Western standards, um, to researchers around the world. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I will Hand, oh, here we go. The links to the form for the ebook and so on. That's all in the chat now. So you can check that out there. Uh, and I think we'll probably save the chat and share that as well with the um, recordings so that you've got access to those resources after the event. So the speakers we have with us are Nicole Brown, author of Photo Voice Reimagined, and Leah Gilman, 
one of the authors of the book on fiction and research. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves rather than introducing them myself, because I think they can do a better job of introducing themselves um, than I can. So can I ask you, Nicole, as the author of the first book in the series, um, to uh, tell us all about it? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm, I'm really excited about this. This is the first time I'm going to be able to talk about this particular book. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited about it. Um, it's been, whoops, sorry. Um, here we go. This is the, the screen that I'd like to share. I have been asked today to talk a little bit about how to bring creativity to your research journey um, and then to draw upon the two books that are with Policy Press. Um, Photo Voice Reimagined, which is the one in, in Helen's series, and the other one is Making the Most of Your Research Journal. Um, I'm not going to be talking like too long about it, just to say about Photo Voice Reimagined actually began as a book to, to try and, and explain what Photo Voice is. And a lot of the times what I have found in, in research journals, um, sorry, in research articles, um, but also in how people are talking about their studies is that they don't necessarily do photo voice projects, but they call them that. So this is why this is um, um, photo voice reimagined. Um, I'm basically in that book um, outlining the different sort of um, opportunities that we have when we're using photographs. Um, so there is an element there of um, you know um, photographs that are supplied by researchers. Um, but then there are also obviously the full blown photo voice um, frameworks where you are doing a very, very participatory approach um, to research. And all of that, you know, for me, the important parts are to be creative in research and to bring creativity to research. Now, the question is, what is creativity? Um, it's quite an interesting one, because for some people, it's, it's the little things in every day that we do like cooking, you know, from, from a recipe and, and putting things together and being creative in that everyday thinking. And for other people, it's very much the big box thinking, you know, where we are geniuses um, who, who are working on Nobel Prize um, materials. So it's those kinds of things that make it difficult. But then the point of creativity in research, as far as I'm concerned, is that, you know, we are trying to do something different for a particular good reason. And this is going, you know, about putting creativity into practice. For me, it's important to have good justifications and a good basic knowledge of, of the theories that are underlying those um, those kinds of um, philosophies. There is no point in doing, you know, like a photograph um, kind of based project without actually understanding why you're doing it, what the point is, and, and, and you know, that there is something there about communicative um, ex forms of expressions, for example. But then doing creativity in research um, is not just about the creative data collection. And that's a lot of the time people are equating that with the data collection methods. There are opportunities to be creative around how you are um, identifying your research topic and your focus um, and the research questions. Yes, there is something there about data collection, but also about analysis and journaling. And this is really in, in in the two books um, that I'm I'm presenting here, um, you know, that from from Policy Press, that that is exactly the, the the line that I'm taking. That it's it's not just about um, you know doing doing creative data collection. And in the Photo Voice Reimagined book, I also have chapters where I specifically talk about um, Photo Voice in analysis and Photo Voice in dissemination. So. It's going through the entire journey from conceptualization through to the end um, of, of actually sharing and, and impact as well. Um, one of the things that I've come across a lot of the times when people are talking to me about creative methods is that they, they worry about failing and, and making mistakes or not getting it right. Um, and that's something that I do think I cover quite well in the book that I'm kind of talking about actually, you know what, you, you try things out um, and, and if there is an, an error or a mistake, it doesn't quite matter as much because ultimately um, there is no obligation for you to share everything. So sometimes when we're doing analysis, using creative approaches to analysis, we can do that in our own spaces. And yes, you may share the process in some cases, but in some cases you may not share some of the stages, just like you wouldn't necessarily share all of the coding details and categories that you've identified when you're doing interview transcripts, for example. Um, so there is something there about, you know, like basically just building that space and that that confidence. And I hope that that's something that comes through the book. 
Um, I have put some um, links in the chat function. Um, sorry, I'm stop trying to stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Um, I have put some links in the in the chat function um, because there is a another book that I, I has just come out as well on creativity. Um, that's more to do with creativity and education, but that may be of interest to some of you. And then obviously, yeah, the photo voice reimagine and making the most of your research journal. And I'm going to stop talking here for now. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that anybody may have, um, you know, about the book or about yeah, conceptualizations of creativity, whatever it is, whatever whatever is interesting to you. Handing over to Helen again. Thanks, Nicole. That's great. And I think we'll hear from everybody uh, before we take questions. I think that that will work best. But if you have questions for Nicole, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen for your questions. Um, and then the chat, of course, for any resources you may have, any technical problems and so on. Um, so I think now we'll go straight to Leah, if that's OK with you, Leah, and uh, hear about fiction in research. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. Right. I'll just get myself set up. Can you see my screen there? Okay, right, I'm all set up. So um, thank you, first of all, to Baha, Baha and Helen for organising this uh, really fantastic event. And thank you, Nicole, for your talk. That was really, really interesting as well. Um, so my name's Leah Gilman. I'm a research fellow at the University of Sheffield. Uh, and my talk today is based on this um, soon to be published book, as Helen mentioned, uh, which is co-authored with Becky Tipper. So um, Becky, Becky's the lead author on this book and she would have loved to have been here today, but we just couldn't quite make it work with the time difference because she's in the United States. Um, so Becky, to introduce her as well, she's um, she also used to be an academic uh, researcher, but she's also um, she's now a fiction writer primarily, and she's been working on various projects with, in collaboration um, with re re academic researchers. And we have been working together on various projects since about 2018 to 2019. So today I'm going to speak to this question of, you know, how to bring creativity into your research by focusing, as you probably guessed, on fiction and what that can bring to the research endeavour. Right, I'm just going to move my slides along. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is that there's probably quite a good chance that fiction is already part of your research practice or that they, there at least could be some points of connection there. So this could be in the process of, for example, like fictionalization, fictionalization like inventing pseudonyms or creating composite case studies. Um, in social science research, especially, um, it could be that um, research your research aims are partly informed by fictional stories. So, an example we give in the book is about science fiction novels, um, offering ideas about possible technological futures that then can be the research might kind of pursue in real real life research. Um, we also talk about the importance of things like thought experiments, so uh, Schrodinger's cat being the kind of famous example um, to develop research ideas and hypotheses. So perhaps the question is not so much if you should bring fiction into your research, but more, you know, when, whether, how this might be something that you want to embrace within it and develop. So if this is something you're considering, then I guess similar to what Nicole said, we would say it's really important to know where you're coming from and what your rationale is for, for doing that. Um, and of course, we are far from the first people to suggest that fiction has something to offer researchers. Um, our own thinking is particularly indebted to some of the pioneers of fiction within social science, such as Laura Richardson, Patricia Levy, um, Ash Watson. Um, but in this book, we're kind of trying to look across disciplines and consider the kind of different rationales, which many others have given for bringing fiction and research together. Uh, we identify sort of three key theoretical underpinnings, which are kind of overlapped, overlapping in various ways. Um, so we talk about the, the fundamental appeal of stories, the idea that this is something kind of hardwired about the human tendency to organize and understand life through stories, um, that kind of rationale. Um, we also talk about how um, authors use stories and fiction to address um, politics of representation. So 
for example, um, fiction might be used to kind of better convey the complexity of human experience, particularly embodied and emotional aspects. Um, and of course, there are also kind of multiple authors and scholars who've, who've used fiction in response to postmodernist, feminist, black feminist, post-colonial kind of critiques of positive, positivism and um, sort of claims to kind of objective knowledge claims, um, and particularly in relation to kind of claims to kind of represent the lives and experiences of others. So um, or, um, researchers have used that to sort of complicate and problematize those ideas in, in various ways. Um, and finally, there are those who use fiction to kind of go beyond data. So using imagination and storytelling to go beyond that which data has been or could be produced. Um, so there's, there's a nice example of um, archaeologists Heldon and Witcher who kind of explain how imagination is really central to their work as archaeologists who inevitably have, you know, loads of this historical data, but also, you know, lots of things that they can never kind of um, directly kind of know or have data about. Um, and kind of cross-cutting all of this are, of course, kind of questions about engagement and kind of impact um, of research as well. Um, and I guess the argument they're making is that it's really important to kind of um, know where your own approach sits within this kind of history and this, this um, of using fiction. Um, then the next step we would suggest is to kind of explore what others others have done. What have others done to bring fiction into the research? And in the book, in the book, we're kind of examining like a, a series of case studies to show how researchers have brought fiction fiction into different aspects of the research process. So we we show how some researchers kind of use fiction to think with. Um, so maybe drawing on fictional ideas and concepts to, to develop their analysis. Um, other researchers invite participants to create or co-create fictions with them as part of the research process. Um, and those stories can become data or they might become outputs or they might become both. Um, and then I guess the most obvious example is where fiction is being used as a way to share knowledge um, developed in research. And we, we showcase a number of works here, including kind of um, verbatim theater production, um, um, Shireen Hamdi and Coleman Nye's ethno ethnographic novels uh, about medical decision making. Um, we also include um, analysis of a couple of short story collections and a speculative fiction novel um, in darkened story work by sociologist S.R. Tolliver. So, you know, hopefully this has piqued your interest and you're thinking this all sounds, you know, quite interesting. Um, however, Becky and I felt it was really important to write a book that was more than like a manifesto for bringing fiction and research together. Um, so one of the chapters that we've included is called Difficult Questions. So there we explore questions like, OK, is, is embracing fiction right for your research and your research objectives and the context you're working in? Um, how can we sort of evaluate research fiction? Um, what would that mean to do that? When is it appropriate to do that? Um, relatedly, is, is research fiction kind of necessarily good fiction? And do these kind of, and when and how do such questions matter? We also look at um, some of the ethical issues um, that come up when you kind of combine research and fiction together. And we also think about questions about how research fictions should be framed or can be framed and things like how can people kind of reference, how can like future researchers reference uh, uh, research fiction. So the book is really prat practical. Um, as Helen said, the whole series is really practical, kind of this how to guides. And I want to finish by just sharing one of the exercises that we suggest people can do to, to start exploring the possibilities for fiction in their particular research context. Um, so one of these exercises is all, all about metaphors and similes. So um, if it's okay, I'd like you all to maybe just take 30 seconds. Um, I'll stop talking for 30 seconds in a second, just to kind of write down all of the similes and metaphors that have maybe come up um, in relation to your particular area of research. It doesn't matter if you've kind of not sort of started a project yet, but you've maybe got one in, got one in mind. So it might be, uh, metaphors that participants have used, if you've got research participants who you're speaking to in your study. Um, it might be metaphors which circulate right around this particular topic in the media or in scientific or in public discourses of the topic. 
So just to quickly give you an example, um, my uh, sort of substantive area of research is around donor conception. So common metaphors and similes that come up for me are, um, so interviewing donor conceived people who um, discovered that they were donors conceived when they took a DNA test, repeatedly got uh, references and comparisons to, um, it was like they were on the Jeremy Kyle show, for those of you who kind of, um, uh, would understand that kind of cultural reference. So a TV show um, where there's often DNA testing and big reveals involved. Um, and then others, so talking to egg donors, lots of egg donors kind of either telling me this is kind of a bit like just giving something to charity and other egg donors telling me it's absolutely nothing like giving anything to charity, but that kind of metaphor often came up either way. Right, so I'll, I'll just give you 30 seconds now and then I'll quickly come and round everything up. Okay, so hopefully that was enough time to maybe think of a few a few um ideas or examples. Um, but what we sort of suggest in the book, one of the things we suggest, and all credit to Becky for this idea, I love it. Um, is writing then writing some kind of story or starting to writing where the metaphor becomes literal. Um, and this is an exercise that Becky developed, inspired by a Cecilia Ahern story, in which um. A uh, short story in which a woman is so embarrassed that the kind of idea that she just wanted the floor to swallow her up literally comes to life. And this, the floor really does swallow up this woman because she is so embarrassed and is in this situation. So, um, yeah, maybe someone might want you might want to go away and kind of develop that idea a little bit more. But it gives you a sense of the kind of practical way you could develop this. OK, um, I think that's probably the end of my 10 minutes. So I will stop there. But thank you so much for listening. And of course, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Leah. That was a, a great little um, whistle stop tour. And it's lovely to see um, some um, metaphors coming into the chat. Some of you are sending them just to host some panelists. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But if you want to repost them into the public chat, um, please feel free, because I think these are really interesting and useful for, for everyone to see. Um, yeah, this is this is I love seeing these examples um, coming through. It's so interesting. Oh, my goodness. I really relate to the asthma research one being asthmatic myself. Um, yeah, these are these are these are fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But before I get drawn into swerving into a presentation on metaphors in research, I need to rein myself in from that because uh, that's something I'm I'm quite I find quite enjoyable, and talk to you a little bit about phenomenography, which is the topic of the book that will be out in September by Amanda Taylor Bezik and Eva Hornung, and they've done a great job. And there was no how to do phenomenography book in the literature at all well no actually I think there was one published in about 2005 but it was a bit it wasn't um comprehensive in today's terms and it's hard to get hold of now um so yeah things have moved on a lot as the thing with creative research methods is things move and change and this one of the things um that this means is that the terminology can be a bit complex slippery and changeable um, photo voice. I mean, Nicole didn't talk about photo voice versus photo elicitation, but I know she could have done. Um, fiction and research is clearer because that's more everyday language. But phenomenography is a big, complicated word, and it sounds a lot like phenomenology, which confuses me and everybody. And I just want to try and encapsulate the difference if I can. Um, phenomenology is really a more theoretical perspective. Um, that focuses on phenomena, which might be an object or an experience or an interaction or, um, you know, something more complex than that. Whereas phenomenography is an empirical and practical approach for understanding how people experience things. Because we all experience things in different ways. If everyone here was asked how they experienced this webinar, we probably all would have some different answers um, because we bring our own um, experience and filters and biases and so on. And so um, if we know a lot about creative methods, we'll experience this webinar very differently than if we're coming to it for the first time um, and so on, all of these kinds of things. And what phenomenography 
tries to do and actually does really rather well is elicits the differences between these different experiences and learns from those. The method began in education, um, but it has expanded. It's really applicable to all disciplines, as you can probably tell. And this often happens with creative methods is they start in a discipline and then they expand outwards. So like cultural probes started in design research, but are now used throughout the social sciences, the arts and beyond. Um, and for, equally, phenomenography started in education, but is now being used in a wide range of disciplinary contexts. And it's particularly useful for questions about, as you would expect, people's experiences. So how do patients experience knee replacement surgery? That would be a great question for phenomenography to help answer. How do molecular biologists experience their lab work? How do pupil barristers experience their first court appearances? These kinds of um, quest research questions are potentially relevant um, for phenomenography to answer. And as you can see, that means it's really applicable right across disciplines. Now, in terms of the how to do it, I didn't have enough time um, to prepare because uh, poor old Amanda had to drop out very suddenly. Um, so the actual how to do it, well, you're just going to have to read the book if you want to know how to do it. Um, but it focuses on describing people's experiences and then analysing those descriptions. I think that's the, the sort of a very simple tagline description of how phenomenography works. Um, and I think it's a fascinating method. And I'm really glad that in this series we've been able to include the first proper current how to book on phenomenography. So that's just a quick canter through. We've now used up half of the webinar time and the other half can be used with questions. However, I do not see any questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to start asking some questions to my colleagues here. We'll have a chat among ourselves. Um, but if you have questions for any or all of us, please do put them in the Q&A. You can also upvote questions in the Q&A. I would have put a few in there myself, but I think I can't put questions in it. I can only see the questions that are in it. Um, so we'll have to be a bit uh, creative and work um, off the tops of our heads here, I think. So, oh, wait, no, there's a question in the Q&A. Let's just see if it's an actual. OK, Natalie, go ahead. What's your question? Can you type it in? Um, uh, oh, is that... Is that the question? How could you use photo voice for dissemination? Nicole, do you yes. want to speak to that? Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. And basically, um, so photo voice um, is essentially um, an approach um, that's actually steered towards dissemination straight from the beginning. This is where, um, as Helen hinted, um, the photo elicitation and photo voice often get um, mixed up. And in the book, I specifically talk about photo voice as a method or photo voice as a framework. And in the photo voice as a framework, which is the original in, in, um, sort of intention of photo voice, it basically means that you are um, using the photographs that have been produced um, during the data generation phase um, to connect your participants with stakeholders um, to demonstrate and, and physically show them um, their experiences. And from that, um, together with the analysis where you're kind of bringing forward some kind of recommendations for change and for practice, this is then where you're using those photographs in, for example, a gallery exhibition, um, and, and you're getting the stakeholders to come to that gallery exhibition because the photographs are so powerful, they, feel, they will feel compelled to actually put forward the changes or put, implement the recommendations that have been um, made. So this is in, in many ways um, where the photographs are used, um, you know, for, for example, in a gallery exhibition. In the book, I'm also um, sharing other examples. There is um, a, a very, very exciting example from the United States um, where there are podcasts, where there are, you know, and they have actually, they're kind of more like blogs, video logs. Um, that have taken over so much that they actually um, even appeared on, on, on local and national TV. So there are opportunities of actually put, putting these um, photographs and, and th therefore, thereby um, calling for action and calling for change. So I hope I've kind of answered that question, really. <laughs> I think you did a great job. Thanks, Nicole. That's, that's excellent. We've had a question um, from Megan 
Crossley saying, please, can we speak a little bit more about creativity in the analysis stage and particularly analysis that's co-produced with participants? Um, I can take this one to start with. One thing I can tell you, and this probably just seems like a shameless plug. Oh, no, that's the wrong link. Uh, I, this is an issue that's come up before in these webinars. People ask a lot about analysis. And as a result, from a webinar I did in 2021 with Dawn Manet and Alistair Roy, We've actually now produced a handbook of creative data analysis. I say we've produced it in production at the moment. It'll be published in September, but it's got over 30 chapters um, talking about different kinds of analysis, including quite a lot of co-created analysis. So that book will help you a whole lot. Um, Leah and Nicole, add, yes, yeah, please do. Can I just add that? Um, so with, when you're looking at Photo Voice, for example, um, again, you know, this is the Photo Voice Reimagined book. Um, if you're using, um, you know, like photographs as analysis, what you would be doing is, um, you know, you're not necessarily analyzing the photos, although you do do that as well, but you're also creating your own photographs as an analytical step. And in many ways, that's what Leah will say, the same thing about um, fiction writing, that the actual process of writing the fiction, that is, that is in itself analysis so it's not just about you know creating a story um that's that's interesting or creating a photograph that's that's pretty it's also about the process the sense making happens in the process of creating either the fiction or the photograph you're on mute Helen. i think that's a really good yeah i just realized i think that's a really good point and one of the things we learned from editing the handbook is that analysis isn't a separate stage of research that happens after gathering data and before reporting findings but it actually permeates the whole research process almost from the very design stage analytical thought is beginning um and and it continues so uh, yeah that's great leah do you want to add anything to that um, not much, but just to, yeah, obviously broadly to very much agree with the things you were saying and just to put that into the context of fiction. Um, so, yeah, I found it really interesting when um, so Becky and I have worked together where she was kind of commissioned to write short stories. And then we kind of iteratively kind of collaborate, collaborated on to kind of developing those. And I found it so interesting, the fact that as when she was looking at them as potent, the data as potential for story, Becky was seeing kind of different things in that data that then led us to kind of go and um, reanalyze and re-look back at the, these kind of um, aspects of the interviews we'd done, in this case with egg donors and um, sperm donors. Um, so I found that really interesting. And in, in response to the idea of kind of bringing participants in, then the stories then become another kind of point of discussion with participants so they can kind of discuss them as they relate to their, their experiences as well so yeah great thank you so we've had some more questions which is lovely there's a couple on phenomenography so let me take those um professor Jacqueline Allen Collinson asks if I've used auto phenomenography in my work as well as phenomenography I have never used phenomenography I'm speaking on behalf of Amanda Taylor Bezik and Eva Horning who've written the book on phenomenography because Amanda couldn't be here so I'm just talking about the method um, so I haven't used either of them um, but it sounds really interesting and I will be checking it out um, it's actually since in soir what would the research design be has an empirical aspect? Would quantitative analysis be possible? Yes, to some extent it would, although I think it would mostly be qualitative, but you could do multimodal analysis and include some quantitative elements um, because your data is all qualitative. Um, you'd need to use qualitative analysis as well to get as much meaning out of the data as you could, but you could certainly use um, some quantitative work in there as well. Um, Yongmi Nicola Joe, what are the main kinds of theoretical approaches used for creative methods? Well, you know what? Um, you're welcome. Um, you can use any theoretical approach, really. Um, I mean, I wouldn't think probably positivism gets used a whole lot these days, but pretty much you can use any um, theoretical approach. I don't know if Nicole or Leah want to comment on this at all. Yes, thank you. So I think, uh, like like Helen said, it, it's adaptable. Um, it, it depends on going back to what Leah and I were saying, it depends on, on why you actually want to use them. Um, for example, a lot of the arts-based approaches in research, that kind of creative method, um, we are using for um, the, the powers of, of expression, the powers of evocation, the powers of illumination. And that's the, that one element of it. Um, when you're looking at it from an embodied point of view, um, that's been mentioned earlier as well, um, you know, the embodiment, that's something where you, you're able to, to tap into people's bodily experiences and their emotions. Um, and again, the creative methods help it, um, people, participants to express those emotions and embodied experiences. 
um, where other, other forms of expression are perhaps not quite helpful. For example, if we're thinking just a very quick thought experiment, if you're thinking of a headache, think about the words that you would use to describe that headache. Um, you're probably coming up with things like throbbing, you know, um, pounding, that kind of thing. But what about we're not talking about that headache. We're talking about the headache that you get just before you have a fever. Are the words the same or are they different? Because the headache's not exactly feeling the same, is it? So the words actually can't be exactly the same either. You can see that there is a problem. Um, what about the, when we're talking about the, he the headache of a hangover? Different kind of headache again. So we're talking about one exp embodied experience, but actually the, the definition of it is very, very different. And that's why the creative methods are often helpful um, for people to kind of express themselves. And that's where um, the theoretical approaches, um, you know, they, they don't matter as much as the kind of research that you want to do, the philosophical standpoint that you take to get to the experiences, for example. Lovely. We, we've now got lots of questions, which is great. Um, Leah, do you want to take the next one from Olga? I, she says, I recently wrote a paper on the lessons learned and critical reflections using with adolescents in rural areas in Mozambique. Do we need to always disseminate results as the last step? Is the change always the ultimate goals? Leah? You're muted. Sorry, I was just reading the question. Um, oh, okay. So it's, do we always need to disseminate? Sorry, I'm just reading it. Do we need to always disseminate results as the last step? Is the change always the ultimate goal? Um, I guess linking it to, I guess, I don't know if this is linked to fiction specifically, um, but I think certainly with you, if um, fiction was something that was part of the research process that it definitely doesn't always need to be disseminated. Um, it might be that the process of writing the fiction and discussing that with participants then becomes becomes what is shared, or it may be that some aspects of that are, are, are part of the dissemination, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to, to be that the fiction is ultimately shared. That would be my view. I'm not quite sure if that was the, the the intended question or not. Thank you. Nicole, is there anything you want to add briefly to that? Um, I think, you know, it, it, it depends on why you're doing research and what is research for. I think that that's a, a whole load of a bigger question. Um, and, and in some ways, for me personally, but that's 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 my personal opinion. I'm struggling with um, doing research just for the research sake. So for me, it always has to be linked to some kind of activism work and some kind of you know greater benefit because otherwise how can I justify to myself that I'm asking these participants to share their experiences with me to give their time to commit to 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 the work for me um if it ultimately then only benefits me and my career that that is not good enough a good enough reason um and if it only benefits the university because they get get some money through funding again that's for me is not a good enough reason so I think for me the question is does it always have to be linked to some kind of change? For me, yes, absolutely, it does have to. But sometimes change is not monumental. Change is sometimes just a tiny, tiny step. But ultimately, for me personally, it always has to be, yes. Great. Thanks both. I'm just going to do quick answers to the next two questions, then we'll have a couple more chunky ones. Federico is asking about the sounds research. Um, do I have any reference? So the author of the book is Simone Eringfeld. I'm going to put that um, into the written answer so that you've got the correct spelling. She's a polar researcher, so she's off in the Antarctic at the moment collecting sound data. Um, and we are expecting the book to be out uh, mid, mm, probably not till late 2025 because she's currently doing field work in polar regions and can't actually manage writing a book as well as doing all that which is completely understandable um, but she does have a contract so it will be coming and I think it will be really good. Laura, um, keen to do more creative research but colleagues less enthusiastic. I'm now going to do something extremely transgressive and suggest a book from Sage that I have written, which I think you might find helpful. My first degree was pure quant in psychology, so I know exactly what you're talking about. For a lot of people, there's a great deal of safety in p-values and quant research, statistical research, which isn't easy, but once you know how to do it, it's much more straightforward than the qualitative side where there's so many more options. 
Um, I'm getting really good feedback on this book. So I would recommend that you get hold of a copy of that and give it to your colleagues or encourage them to read it. And it does include creative research as if creative research was totally mainstream because, you know, one day it will be. So I'm just anticipating a bit. Um, you're welcome. Uh, I hope it does help. So now from an anonymous attendee, we have a question about how acceptable are creative methods for journals, especially ABS ranked journals, and what should an author ensure in order to pass through peer review? I'll put the link to the book in the chat in a moment. Um, Nicole and Leah, would you like to take a, give your views on this and then I'll, while I find that link and then I'll add mine on? Um, I'm happy to say something on this if that's helpful. Um, so first of all, um, in the book, if, when it comes to fiction, we do include um, a list of um, journals that we know of across different disciplines that do accept um, fictional contributions. Um, and there are various journals, particularly in the social sciences, that will allow, um, will accept um, fictional um, submissions. Um, I guess it is, it, it's definitely much more varied in kind of across different disciplines, though that's certainly the case. And this relates to the Helen's point about um, the question that Helen answered about justifying your methods. Um, but I guess it kind of comes, I guess, one of the ways in which you can kind of um, support that process is by having that clarity of why you're using the particular methods you're using and how they relate to your research objectives. But yeah, certainly going to be more of a challenge with some journals than others. Can I quickly add? Can I quickly yes, add? Yes, please. There is, a new, there is a new journal series coming out. <laughs> and I'm 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 pointing towards that because Helen is going to is basically putting that together too. And it's something that the Bristol University Press and Policy Press are supporting. Um so if you if you do think that in your own disciplines you can't really find journals that are appropriate for your kind of work, consider that one. Um, it's an international creative research methods journal, um, which is looking at different kind of disciplinary backgrounds. So there is no disciplinary convention or, or constriction. Um, and, and it's looking at exactly that kind of work. Helen, do you want to add? Yes, and thanks, Nicole. It is still under construction. Um, yeah, it's but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. And part of why it's coming is because we've recognised that while in some disciplines and fields it's really straightforward now getting work published um, that's been used been done using creative research methods in others it's still more difficult um, but it is perfectly possible and there are journals that will happily accept work done using creative methods um, and they often the methods journals of course are very interested um, but then they only want an article on methods but journals like qualitative inquiry um, qualitative or health and exercise or whatever it's called. Um, a lot of the journals that start with qualitative now accept creative methods as a matter of course. Um, and plenty of those are highly ranked journals. So you absolutely can get creative work published in journals. And sometimes even journals that were not historically receptive to creative methods are becoming more receptive as it's becoming more well-known and more widespread. And some journals are just taking a very creative approach. There's there's one journal, I know my, one of my colleagues wrote about it in the book we did on creative research methods in education for Policy Press a couple of years ago. Um, there's an education journal, let me see if I can quickly find it, I know whose chapter it's in, uh, which only now accepts video submissions and only um, has articles published as videos. It doesn't in any sense use print. Uh, so I'm just, yeah, well, here we go. The Journal of Embodied Research. It's the first peer-reviewed open access academic journal to accept only video articles. Um, and you can see why video articles would work well with embodiment. Um, so there you go. I hope that's enough on, on academic journals. We've got another question from Natalie for Nicole asking about the ethical side of things. Um, can you share a little bit about how to deal with private or sensitive data captured through the photographs? Do, you, do I need an ethical consideration from a committee for conducting research using that method? And I think Leah may well also have, I'll come to Nicole first, but I think Leah may also have something to say about fiction and ethics. Um, so off you go, Thank Nicole, you. you could go first. Thank you, yes. So. Um... Just to say, I, I should also say that um, in my in my day job, um, I'm associate professor at University College London Institute of Education, and here I am actually head of research ethics and integrity um, for all faculty research. 
So anything to do with ethics, I'm taking that very, very seriously. It's it's something that is quite close to my heart. Um, there are there are different kinds of things going on here. So on the one on the one hand, the question is, do I need ethical consideration from a committee for conducting research that method? To be honest, at IOE, we have um, a requirement that all of our staff have to go through ethics um, approval system for all research, even if it's not directly correct collecting data from participants. So we, we do take that very seriously because actually um, the ethics review is on the one hand, yes, it is about you know trying to make sure that um, participants don't come to harm, but at the same time, the ethics process is also ensuring that researchers are protected when anything happens or if anything happens or if a complaint comes in. So I would suggest that no matter whether your institution requires it or your country requires it, I personally always recommend going through some form of ethical process and ethical approval system. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The other thing to say is, you know, about the, how to deal with the private or sensitive take data captured through the photographs. And there is something there that's really, really important because a lot of the time people kind of talk about, well, I'm going to blur the, the picture, I'm going to blur the faces. Well, sometimes even an object can actually identify a person. I've got a very special pen. That pen, if I have leave that in any room at our IOE building, people know that I was in the room because, because that pen is only my pen, nobody else has it. So it's something that an object can even be identifiable. So even if, if you were to blur my face, people would still know it, it's me. So that's that. But also in addition to that, all photographs actually don't just capture the photograph, doesn't don't just cap the, ch capture the scene that you're in, depicting, they also capture GPS data. So that's the metadata that's inscribed in photographs. So that, that's where you get the timestamp, for example, or that's where you get the GPS data as to where the photograph was taken. And a lot of people don't necessarily know about that metadata, how to wipe it, how to, how to, to make sure that it's not shared. So what happens is a lot of the time these photographs get shared, even put on the Internet. And actually, with a simple click of, of a button, I could trace back that image to the exact location of where it was taken. So the security of it is something that I'm taking very, very seriously. And again, I'm sharing some strategies in the photo, um, photo voice reimagined book as to how you can deal with that. On the other hand, I'm not saying don't share the photographs. Because there is something for me, again, that it's an ethical issue to, to actually, we are giving voice to people. And by saying, you know, don't share the photographs, you're not allowed to use them in public and we don't, we don't allow to, to have people's names attached to it. What you're essentially doing is you're silencing those people again. So it's a very, very ethically, it's a very, very difficult balance that you have to strike between sharing but protecting at the same time. Um, I hope that's kind of been a little bit helpful as an insight into into the the thinking that goes on behind that. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Leah? Uh, yes, thanks, Helen. Well, it's a huge question, I guess, um, the ethical implications of um, kind of bringing fiction and research together. I guess a couple of points to make would be that, I guess, one, I think it's probably... A, a good thing but it does probably create more complexities and research for people to think about by kind of doing something a bit different um or thinking more creatively about how to do the res your research in different kind of ways that have, that have been kind of standard methods it it causes you it ne necessarily means that you have to have this kind of greater reflection about the ethical process because you can't just assume that the standard processes are going to be able to address issues that are raised. But again, I think I feel that's a good thing and that we should all be doing that anyway in all aspects of research. Um, but then I, I think that an interesting um, thing that comes up in the context of fiction and research that might be perhaps different to other kind of creative methods is this blurring, I suppose, of what the boundaries of a research encounter might be and how to address the kind of ethical issues around, around those kind of things. and. Um, yeah, that would be kind of one of the key, um, key, I guess, issues that comes up in fiction as um, as opposed to other creative, creative research methods. And that's something that we kind of talk about um, more in the book. But of course, whatever the responses be, is going to always be very contextual, um, depending on the research project.
Okay, brilliant. Thank you both. We only have eight minutes left and we have still do have several more questions to answer. So we're going to have to start being a little bit more uh, brief and targeted. Let me see if I can take the next one. Anonymous attendee. Oh, no, wait, there's a point. There's a point that was made in the chat. I can't see the chat and the Q&A at the same time. So I'm struggling a bit. But there was a point made in the chat that I just want to highlight. Deborah Park said, and um, this is going back a bit on the matter of justifying asking participants to share their experience. I agree that it's valuable and perhaps preferable to disseminate results. I would not at all discount the value to many participants of being able to share their story with someone, which is, Nicole, very similar to what you were saying. It seems to me that we are always changed in some way or that we always grow as researchers and people by hearing other people's stories. Um, and I really agree with that. Um, so let me just nip back to the Q&A. Uh, anonymous attendee, developing a methodology to explore the experiences of South Asian female writers, thinking of putting together a research collective to create a zine to be able to discuss this with participants in a safe space. Well, I can tell you now that um, I can tell you two things about that. Hang on, I need to find a link. Uh, there we go. Um, one is that I'm in the process of commissioning a book on zines from the, for the series. I'm talking to someone who's a pretty much a zine expert and who is um, open to the idea, wants to work, wants to write collaboratively and is um, talking to a potential writing partner. So we're at that stage. So that's not going to be out for another probably in time for you. Uh, but I can also tell you that there will be two zine workshops at this year's International Creative Research Methods Conference. And I will put the link to that in the chat in case people are interested. It's a conference that is available online um, or in person in Manchester, England. And I'm not sure if the zine workshops are in the online conferences, but the programmes for both are online. So you can have a look and check. They may only be, we've got four streams, two of which are hybrid, i.e. accessible for people online, because some of the conference sessions are not right for online because you'd just be watching a lot of people in Manchester having fun in a room in Manchester and not being able to really join in. Um, so we're being quite careful. But the um, it's the names of the people on the programme um, may be useful for you to follow, to have a look at their work. Um, and I hope that will give you some help. And Nicole's typing an answer for you too. And then Hamid is asking for the significance of sociological fiction for public sociology. Leah, I have a feeling this might be one for you, although I'm not sure whether you call yourself a sociologist. You do. Okay, there you go then. Question for you. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely call myself a sociologist. Um, so I guess I would defer to some other people on this one. Um, so Ash Watson's written a brilliant paper on um, the the use of the novel for in relation to the kind of goals of public sociology. Patricia Levy's written extensively about how fiction and particularly a kind of emotive pull of uh, of fiction as a genre can enable us to to kind of create change in people that creates change in policies and social kind of political change as well. Um, the really good example, obviously, is the at the moment in the UK is a lot of discussion about the post office scandal um, and the the, the dramatisation of that on television has now become there's basically at the same time as me and Becky were finishing off the book. There's been all this discussion on the radio and the television about, oh, how, can't believe it's taken a television drama to produce this political change. And now all these polit politicians are talking about it. So co completely closely linked. And lots of people who use sociological fiction are uh, kind of signed up to the kind of goals of public sociology and that that they bringing the public into their research and for their research to be impactful. Um, but I guess one of the questions that, um, the kind of difficult questions that Becky and I wanted to raise with the book as well is like, okay, how is this always the case? How, access how accessible necessarily is fiction? How many people are actually, um, how many people do read fiction in their everyday lives? And where is this being published? Um, Will Gibson's wrote about this, that often the, the, these uh, sociological fictions might end up being published in methodology journals. And is that necessarily kind of achieving the goals that we want them to do and the tensions with academic career expectations, all this kind of thing. So um, yeah, very much signed up to those um, ideas about it being for public sociology, but I think we also want to kind of raise those questions around it as well. That's really helpful. Thanks, Leah. Um... So great, we have a couple more questions. Um, about one about creative research methods to pull out the res pull out the research from a PhD on creative writing. There's a couple of other books. Well, my book on creative res research methods might help. I'm frantically trying to find the link for that and failing. And also one I've done for Policy Press on creative writing in social research. 
um, with Richard Phillips. Uh, Bahar, if you can grab the links for both of those and pop them in the chat, that would be really useful. Um, and Rosie, I think those would help you um, to get to where you want to go. Uh, Moral Masuoka is saying, any suggestions for community arts organisations who want to collaborate with researchers? I don't know where you are, Moral. I mean, if you're talk if you're asking for suggestions for the UK, um, I'm sure there are plenty. Um, but if you're outside of the UK, then I would struggle more. Um, I don't have particular organisations to suggest. They tend to community arts organisations tend to be very local and place based. Um, so I think it's very much about thinking about where you're based and what's in your area. Uh, and what you can you can find. I don't know if, if my colleagues have anything to add to that. I agree with what you're saying, Helen, that often it's very localized and very sort of contextualized in the local communities. Um, I would suggest to, to literally just not necessarily even look at big arts organizations, but actually go to, for example, if in your local area, you've got a lay, um, a lay theater, for example, contact them and see whether they, they are um, um, you know interested in connecting with you over some kind of performances. Have a look at the local gallery, see what, what is required um, to get in touch with the artists are, are, are exhibiting there. Can you get them involved? So I, I wouldn't necessarily look at the big art organisations, um, although there are plenty of them around as well. But um, if it's, you know, sort of, you know, you're starting out, it would be just a case of, of reaching out to them. And I have found a lot of the time when I have done that. Um, artists are very um, open, even if they've never done that kind of collaboration before they're very keen on doing it. Um, the only thing that I would like to add to that is that you should pay them. Make sure that you're not necessarily, you know, just because they're artists and they're painting doesn't mean that they're painting for free. They also have bills to pay. So it's something that that I would suggest that, you know, when you do collaborate with artists that you, you get, um, you know, you think about the, the financial implications. And I see from, am I, no, I'm not muted, good. I see from the chat, um, that you're in Edinburgh. Oh, you're having trouble working with, connecting with researchers, you're in Edinburgh. Okay, talk to the Binks Hub. Um, Binks Hub at um, the university, they're one of our conference sponsors. Um, they're very interested in all this sort of thing. They're local to you. They're part of Edinburgh University. I'm just gonna put a link in the chat um, and they will be, oh, thanks Federico, you're way ahead of me. Um, they should be able to help you, Moral, to find the researchers that you want to work with because they're very interested in connecting artists and researchers um, and they're in your area. So I'm glad we were able to help with that. Um, so that's good. And we've actually got to the end of all the cute questions um, just as we get to the end of the webinar, which I think we're all going to disappear in a moment. So thanks very much, everyone, um, for being part of this webinar. Thanks for my colleagues, Nicole and Leah, for being such great panelists and helping to answer the questions. And best of luck with all your creative methods work to, to everyone attending. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Helen.